Welcome for everybody who's here at the moment already. This is um, a live event of an hour where we're going to discuss uh, from human centered design to life centered design. It's organized by the REACH network, which is a worldwide network of about 18 agencies that uh, are based around six continents. And we have four of these great people here on our panel today, which and we'll introduce them uh, a little later. Um, and this is uh, the second live event. We're doing one every week at the moment. So uh, very happy that you're here. We also invite you to keep an eye on the social media for announcements for the next ones. Um, maybe a few small tips. There's four panelists, apart from me, I'm Geike van Dijk. I'm one of the um, partners in the REACH Network, based at Standby. And there's four other speakers. So if you want to see everyone, choose a gallery view at the top of your uh, screen. Uh, it's up to you. You can also choose speaker view, and then you will only see the person who's speaking at that moment. And I'd also like to point out that at the bottom of your screen, you can see a chat and you can see a Q&A. And we suggest to use the Q&A if, if while the, the guests are speaking and, and telling us about projects they're working on, you might have some questions. If you just put that question in the Q&A, we will see them arriving and we will um, take some time in the session to uh, address a few of those questions. So feel free to put them in. And my colleague Nina is here to, uh, to screen those. Um, and use the chat, please, if you have comments you would like to share with everybody the whole audience, everybody who's listening. Then if you put something in the chat, you need to ch uh, choose the option that it's for everyone to hear. So that could be a conversation among the whole audience. So feel free to do that as well. We'd be very interested for comments uh, and keep the Q&A for questions to the panelists. So I think that would be a good moment to start introducing our guests, the speakers of this session. So we have with us four fantastic REACH partners. Um, and they will each introduce themselves briefly. Then I ask Babita first, maybe. Hello, my name is Babita George. I'm a partner at Quicksand, which is one of the REACH partners. We're based in India. We're in three cities in India, Delhi, Bangalore, and Goa. I'm personally, I am in Bangalore right now. Um, and we've been working with the REACH network and otherwise for the past 15 years or so. Um, a lot of our work is in the design research and human-centered design space. But as we're going to talk about it today, in the past few years, uh, some of this work at least has been looking at issues of environment, sustainability, uh, mostly in India, but also in other countries in the global south. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, can I invite Jose maybe to give an introduction? Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Delao. I'm, um, apart from being a, a full-time professor at the Institute uh, at the Monterrey Institute of Technology in Mexico City. I'm also the director of the Lao Design Studio, where uh, we specialized in design-driven research uh, that could go from uh, hum uh, human-centered design to product design to critical and uh, speculative design. Um, we also been working with the uh, Rich Network, I think, for two years now, uh, since we started collaborating in projects uh, around what design can do and their uh, global um, the global challenges that I think Bass is going to to also talk about it later in this talk, and um, and yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Great, thank you. We're excited you're here. Then we have Ricky. Hello, Denmark. I'm Ricky. I'm from Denmark. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and I founded the company called Anthropologne, uh, the anthropologist. Uh, 18 years back and we have been partners in REACH also ever since we founded the network. Uh, we do um, design research but also like anthropology, uh, ethnographic research uh, and um, we deal with both public and private clients but also a lot of volunteer projects that I'm happy to talk about in today. Um, so for us, it has also been this uh, focus on human-centered design always, but a person in a context and a place. So um, I'm really happy to join. Hi to all of you. Lovely. Thank you. 
And then our fourth speaker is Bas. Hello everyone, I'm Bas Reimarkus. I'm one of the directors of Standby, together with Freke, actually your host. We founded Standby some uh, 17 years ago. And we're based in Amsterdam and London, which is the two cities where I live and work. Standby does uh, design research mainly, and we kind of do that as an integral part of innovation and, and change programs in general, often with a very strong design uh, component as well. Um, I'm one of the founders of REACH, and um, what really kind of drives me in my work more recently over the past years, you could say, is to kind of try to find less anthropocentric uh, positions and perspectives in our work, and also less Western centric uh, perspectives in our work. And um, for both, actually, uh, the REACH network has been a great place, platform to actually uh, do that because we are from so many places in the world and um, we all uh, are always exploring kind of new directions where we can take uh, our work. We're looking forward to the discussion uh, today. Nice, so let's head in. The title of this session today is From Human-Centered Design to Life-Centered Design. I'm guessing that most of the people in the audience are well aware of human-centered design and curious for life-centered design as well. So we thought the best way to start maybe with all these uh, super experienced people uh, on board in the panel to give you some examples, just a, a range of different topics uh, that are all dealing with what is this life-centered design, how can we do it? So uh, let's have a brief introductory example of a project. Of course, we can't go through all the details, but just a sense of what what, are, what kind of work are we talking about? Can we get some tangible idea? So let's do it in the reverse order now. <laughs> Bas, can you start <laughs> and give us a, a brief example of a project? Great. Yeah, I'd like to uh, give the example of the work that we have been doing with what design can do over the past, I think, five years now already around uh, climate change. So what design can do is a platform for designers, which is basically um, aiming for a more just and a more sustainable world and trying to find out what contributions uh, designers can actually uh, make to such a world we strive for. Um, we've been involved in their climate action work through uh, design challenges, global design challenges, that what design can do is, uh, is running. We are currently in the middle of the, the third one, actually preparing the third one. Previous ones were about kind of how can we, as humanity, adapt better to, uh, to new climates. And also um, the second one was around clean energy, the clean energy challenge. The current one we're preparing is around uh, no waste, kind of how can we kind of prevent uh, waste, but also how can we prevent the contribution of waste to uh, greenhouse gases, which is kind of quite enormous and waste is also actually destroying our, our habitats and ecosystems which actually take up uh, carbon dioxide so that's also uh, a problem so kind of the way what what yeah you know, what we've learned actually uh, through the years you know work to write the briefs for those challenges because that's our main work to kind of find the opportunities for designers where they can make a difference so there can be a competition and designers can submit ideas. So our work in creating those briefs has taught us that we kind of need to look beyond human-centered design, that we need to look um, beyond kind of putting the human ourselves in the middle and kind of focus more on ecosystems and the kind of systems that uh, actually allow us to live on this planet as humans and that we are very much depending on. This, this raises the complexity of such uh, questions and, and opportunities, of course, enormously, because ecosystems are very complex. And in the end, you're talking about the planet as an ecosystem as well. Uh, but we've learned to embrace those complexities and also to um, kind of think more from a system uh, approach. And this means, for instance, that as a designer, you need to kind of shift from thinking in, there's a problem, I'm going to solve it, to 
there's a whole kind of complex situation and I can do some interventions that can perhaps help shift the system. That's mm -hmm. a very different way of, of thinking that we are normally not taught actually as, as designers and design researchers. Um, Mas, maybe can I, can I stop you here? We'll, we'll get into the project in more detail later, just to make sure that everybody sure. gives the yeah. Can I give one yeah. example? Because people will might be uh, kind of keen <laughs> Super quick. to see what comes out. <laughs> One example that comes out, I'll put a URL in the chat in a minute, is a project called Beehive, which is kind of a more natural cooling system that doesn't take uh, energy as, as Aircoach does. That was uh, uh, submitted from India. And um, this is an example of how we can actually build on what ecosystems do to actually create a better, better world, more sustainable world. Okay, that gives a good sense of the type of uh, projects and the work. Um, let's have another uh, example. Maybe Babita, can you explain about the project that fits within this uh, theme? Sure. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this project and my own learnings uh, from a research project that Quicksand has been working on with the University of Dundee. So this is a GCRF funded project. Uh, the project is really about co-creating alternate narratives for, uh, for decentralized digital futures with rural communities in India. It's quite a mouthful. Uh, but just for the folks on this call, um, to give you a context of where this project was situated, because I think place is really important to talk about what we doing today. Um, so most of rural India is engaged in agriculture. It's, it's not really just an occupation, but the, it's almost sort of the underlying foundation of the reality that people inhabit. So food habits, social structures, religion, so many other aspects of people's lives are absolutely entangled with agriculture. Um, I think to understand rural India, you have to understand agriculture. Um, and we have been lucky in this project to be part of a relatively open-ended project that afforded us the time and space to to explore all of this. So I think uh, right from the beginning, we weren't seeking to build solutions, but to tell stories and narratives about different futures that were hopeful for people. And soon enough, we realized that it wasn't just about the people, but it was about the environments that they were in. Mm. And this framing really helped us think about it in a larger way. Uh, we really began to uncover this intrinsic connection that they have with the environment. One of the communities that we worked with um, were indigenous people called the Suligas in Karnataka, which is the state that I'm in, in South India. The name Suliga itself means people of bamboo. So these are communities that have lived in the forest, that have taken care of the forest, that have sustained themselves with the forest. So when you think of um, solutions or attempting to get to um, stories and understanding their realities. I think that really helped us move from human-centered design to life-centered design because there really was no other way. Um, I can talk a little bit more about it later, but for now. Yeah, well, yeah let's stay, keep these yeah. pro projects in mind while we continue the conversation. It's nice, but it's nice to have a palette of uh, projects in different areas around the world, basically. So let's continue with the project introductions. Maybe Rekia, can you tell us from a project you're working on? Hi. Um, in Denmark, we have um, a lot of uh, water because it's a, uh, it's a, uh, how do we call it? Uh, yeah, it's a sea nation and we have a lot of islands. And uh, my company, Anthropolo, two years back, we moved to an island called Samsø, uh, which is self-sufficient in, um, in energy, green energy. So uh, all people would buy a part of a windmill and be self-sufficient and actually also export um, the, the green energy to the mainland. So Samsø is a little pioneer community uh, for 20 years, we have been the energy island of uh, Denmark and also of the world and count, uh, doing consolation to the UN and stuff 
on the energy side of it. But what is happening at Samsung, uh, my, my company will take part of, and of course myself as, an, uh, as an, an, um, an, uh, a citizen, um, because what we now aim to is to be total fossil free in, in all aspects in 2030. So that all uh, the agriculture, which is a big business here, and the ferry boats that would bring us to the rest of Denmark, they should be totally green uh, in 10 years. And that's a big challenge that we took upon ourselves at this island. Uh, and what I'm um, uh, bringing to the table today is a, a school project. It is actually a um, volunteer project, but it's very much a community project. Uh, wanting to move one of the two schools on the island. Uh, we have only 3,700 3, people living here. So around 300 uh, school kids, 200 would go to the public school and 100 would go to uh, some kind of free school. And this free school, uh, has the ability to experiment. And uh, this school is moving out into a forest, trying to be based, not just instructing um, sustainability, but installing uh, the kids uh, in the forest with new kind of uh, buildings and new kind of learnings. Because we think that uh, children have the ability of being sustainable, uh, we actually uh, wrote sustainability, uh, which we all know, but child ability, uh, that it is kind of natural to children to be curious and know that they are part and everything. Mm -hmm. So the whole project is involving a local community in um, restructuring this, uh, this forest area. And um, for the first two years, they would just go from their school in a very little rural uh, city, uh, three kilometers to this uh, wood and stay there for, next week they would stay there for three days and, and sleep there mm. and everything. So this is an experiment. And um, I'm engaged as a local citizen in, uh, in making this happen. And um, to this project, it is very, very central that it's not only human-centered uh, design, but really life-centered and planet-centric planet design. Um, mm. things, yeah, they, they relate. So that's my Lovely. project. Thank you. Nice example. Now, Jose, tell us about your project. What are you working on? Of course. On? Uh, well, I would like to talk about a project that I Personally, I learn a lot, and I think it uh, mm -hmm. uh, will bring uh, uh, some interesting things to the conversation. It's a project that we did about a year ago, uh, together with the Monterey Institute of Technology, um, and together with two NGOs, one that is called uh, Fundación Origen, and the other one is called Love Army Mexico. And we work with a community called Ocuilan, which is about two hours away from Mexico City. And the, what happened with this community is like uh, some years ago, there was like this massive earthquake uh, in Mexico. And uh, as uh, a lot of people uh, in small communities, they, they build their houses out of adobe and this type of vernacular uh, techniques, a lot of their houses were compromised or they uh, went down. So Love Army Mexico come in, ask some architects, uh, like really famous architects to build this really nice houses for them but uh but apparently housing was not enough also uh the community needed some sort of like uh more economic and activities to help the community to be more self-sufficient so this so uh, we work with these ngos and they give us a brief that they needed like a lot of help right away and they asked us to come up with ways for them to uh, to bring in these economical activities that they were already doing. So they asked me to coordinate about 80 students in a period of five months uh, to, together with other professors, other design professors. It was uh, the, the, um, the course in, in was like really focused on product design, but we are on the way we have to learn that we have to open the scope a little bit and uh, don't be married with the idea that we have to give them 
exactly what it asked us, which was like manuals uh, uh, for them to to go over and have like better practices for what they already were doing. So when I say it was a challenge, it's because sometimes when when people ask you help as a design researcher, they they always want to have this like tangible uh, solution that has to work on the get go. And, and what I, the way that I see that is related to more like life center design is also that you have to be aware of the consequences of the solutions that you will proposing that what will happen afterwards. So this little, it, like what it could seem a uh, positive impact maybe later on could be some could, could bring like negative impact or like confusion or some um, uh, like jeopardizing, for example, the, the actual uh, ecosystem because you want really good intentions and you want to come up with solutions really fast. So that's basically what I would like to discuss from my side in, in this conversation. Nice. So it's really nice that through this wide variety of projects, really the idea of why, what's the drivers behind life-centered design uh, uh, becomes more tangible. So let's dive into that a little bit uh, further. And then maybe rather than me giving you uh, in a circle <laughs> speaking time, you could raise your hand. We could just do a free flowing conversation now about if we want to look, so you introduce the projects and we now want to look a little bit deeper about this urge that comes out of the projects where you are all encountering um, together with the people you're working with that you need to move beyond human centered design what is this shift what is well how, how do you notice this urge can you say something about that who, who of you would want to elaborate on that Rekia? yes um i think i draw this little thing uh, saying that we are uh, nature uh, we all know now, at least with the COVID-19 and everything, that people are <laughs> biology and that we are uh, interrelated and stuff. And we are also culture. We, we, knew, we know that as, as, um, as human beings. But uh, this uh, model is a model that I've been using in my company forever, saying that in the, in the very center is the individual. And then there is a social level. And then there is a societal level, something organizational, societal, whatever. And everything is culture. Uh, but now I, I, I put in those leaves from nature because out, out either in the center or out here uh, around what people are doing uh, in this world, there is a here. We are here. We are born here and we are locals. Uh, we, we are also globals, of course, but we are taking place. Life is an, a local affair. And, and that, mm -hmm. that consciousness is really what uh, drives um, a lot of our projects, actually. Yeah. Not only looking at culture and people, but looking at how we interact and interrelate um, with each other and the yeah. place we live and the quality of life. So yeah. to me, here is, is the, the, the kind of yeah. game changer. <laughs> Any of the other speakers, is this something you recognize from your projects? Uh, I, I recognize the kind of shifting between those levels or kind of playing on these levels, if you like, in lack of a better word, um, at the same time. So what's, what's really important is actually to kind of look at both the individual side but also the kind of the, the planet's side and then everything that's in between the way we've been uh, kind of thinking about sustainability and teaching sustainability has been rather limited i think by not acknowledging all these levels it's been especially in kind of more industrial design it's been really focused on kind of how can we optimize things how can we make them more efficient how can we as they say nowadays create a circular design or how can we perhaps make production more local? But what we forget is to kind of look at how it all adds up. Already now, we are kind of consuming more than 75% more mm. than the planet can actually sustain. So we're consuming 175% of what we could 
actually. And still, we're trying to get people out of poverty and uh, and all these other sustainable development goals. So that that can only rise if we go on on this in this same road. So what we need to do actually is to kind of look at how can we benefit as people, but also how can the entire ecosystem benefit. It's a kind of shift of thinking that is, that's is illustrated well by an image that we use often nowadays and it becomes more and more visible. I've drawn it here in my notebook as well. It says from ego to eco. So at the ego side, you see a pyramid with uh, man at the top. And then in the eco, it's, uh, it's kind of a whole planet with everyone connected on there. And that's a way of thinking that's actually quite different. You need to be more humble, but also you need to embrace much more complex thinking. You need to think in terms of biodiversity, for instance. Maybe if I can add finally one example here in Amsterdam, um, we've had a heat wave because of climate change over the past weeks. It was like 35 degrees in the city. And uh, people were really benefiting from that, uh, from the fact that Amsterdam is a water city because people were swimming in many places in the city, in the water, as if the whole city had turned into a swimming pool suddenly or a beach. But that was not possible even five years ago because the water quality was really bad then. And we hadn't really thought about water quality in a holistic way. More recently, the city has started to think about the biodiversity of water and how it's really important to raise biodiversity in the city because it will improve the water quality. And as a result, we can now swim everywhere. So you benefit from it in the end, but you don't start with, uh, with humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any connections there from other projects maybe about this more holistic approach? Mm. Well, one, one thing that it's quite interesting uh, now that uh, like, because like designers, especially product designers have this paradox of how can we uh, come up with better products when we don't need better, we don't need new products, right? Which it's, uh, and, and then something that we have learned through this research, like the research that we are also doing for what Stein can do about no waste uh, for the no waste challenge is that uh, some of the people that we interview said something that really strike me that uh, she was a scientist specialized in, um, in, in plastic, like microplastics that goes into the sea. And she was like really skeptical about uh, circular economy uh, and circular economy being like this kind of like huge idea like this uh, uh, utopia that it will save us but and, and she was like but wait the circle like circular economy is an economical model it's not a social model and and that shift of of start thinking uh, more into like not from the economical side because it, again design in a way is really economical it 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 needs a market to exist and be self-sufficient. So how can we shift from this economical way of thinking into more social and then into a more holistic, what everything is involved way of thinking when we propose things? Because uh, like this, because uh, like most of the solutions that we have to see or, or that we're seeing is not, it's about sustaining this economy bringing new things and make people consume more, which I, I mean is not bad. It is not as bad as it sounds because also you need this aspect. But in the other hand, also we have to find this balance. We have to find this sweet spot that, that we don't have to forget that this, this aspect, like this economical aspect is, is the most important. Also we have other uh, mm -hmm. aspects and yeah. It's interesting you're calling it finding a balance indeed, because it's always in design research projects, you, you need to find a lot of wishes of different stakeholders. But it seems like with this move from human-centered design to life-centered design, we need to learn to work with a different skill. There's other things on there that we before maybe weren't seeing enough or not uh, using enough. So we need to find new mental models 
and new, I think you mentioned it as well, uh, Babita, before, new narratives to, to, to talk about what we want <laughs> and where we should be going. So connect yeah. to... Uh, Yes, actually. So I had actually pulled out a quote that when we started thinking about the Hugh Hopeful Futures project that I mentioned, uh, we kind of looked at. Um, so it's by H.G. Wells. And um, he said, we were making the future and hardly any of us troubled to think what future we were making. So I wanted to kind of connect it to, I think, what you just said, hey, kid, like, also changing the scale of time um, and how it can not always be for the now. Um, and I think the farmers and the communities we worked with were living examples of that. For them, mm -hmm. there was no separation from the health of their soil, the health of their farms, the food that we eat, the biodiversity, the other plants and animals around them. So just uh, being, they were, um, sort of talking to us about how a hopeful future and a good future for them was not just about their own families and their own lives, but yeah. about all of this. And I think that changing that frame to just being human and what it means to be human in the context of life around you, um, that scale change, as well as the scale change of time, um, I think that um, sort of reinforces this thing of um, the complexity that we're dealing with, I think, like Bas said, and the intrinsic connection to place that Vicky talked about, and therefore, how do we begin to reimagine all of this? And I wanted to kind of show a picture from one of the farmers that we met. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see. Yes, we can. Is, this is Anand, and he's again a small farmer who primarily grows millets and mangoes, really delicious mangoes, on the outskirts of Bangalore. So, of course, all of us love mangoes, but also elephants love mangoes. And this was an area where there are lots of elephants actually pass through to go from one forest to the other. Um, and the typical approach for something this like this would have been to kind of think about how to keep the crops safe from from the elephants mm -hmm. but some friends that we knew scientists and biologists uh, began working with this village and completely reframed this how do we keep our crops safe but also give safe passage to the elephants um, so I think a lot of it has been about reimagining these frames that we begin to think within and for. Um, yeah. Mm, interesting. So it's really a different mindset as well as the designers, researchers you know, think, what's the issue? We'll fix this issue. Yeah. <laughs> because before you know, there's another issue you're, you're raising. Um, and also not that's that sort of not being solution driven but also working together with, with people who may have better knowledge Absolutely. than you are the stakeholder and learning in the project i remember you mentioning that before uh, as well uh, jose where you said we really had to listen and learn in our project do i remember that correct yeah i mean one of the challenges that that we faced was that uh some of the groups like this because um, like in in this place in oquilan uh uh fundacion origen which was like the the ngo that was kind of like the boots on the ground working locally they were helping communities to to come up with uh with uh, uh, with activities that they will give in a little bit more uh, uh money like productive activities, I think, it's the term. So you have a small group that they were doing, you know, like salsas. Another, another group was doing uh, furniture. And there was a, this particular group that was like a family that they were like uh, collecting wood from, from, uh, from the road and like repurposing, repurposing wood to come up with uh, little crafts that they could sell. And, uh, and when we... Uh, saw that as product, design, as, as product design educators were like, well, here we have like a great uh, chance to come up with nice things that could be like really tangible and, can, and we can help them. 
But then we realized that that process itself, even if it sounds really nice, like repurposing wood that you're using, picking it up and reusing and all these type of things, it wasn't as sustainable. Because in terms of tooling, in terms of finishing, and in terms of uh, treating the wood was like really expensive and not as sustainable as, as we wanted to. For example, they were using gasoline uh, to, to curate the wood or clean it, uh, and gasoline is not that uh, cheap, right? And, and also how you're going to dispose this, this gasoline in these rural areas when we have like a lot of problems to do so. So, and that's kind of like the picture that I want to, to show. I hope you guys can see it. Uh, and this is the, mm -hmm. the family uh, and the students uh, having this dialogue of learning together what they can do and, and discussing what, what, what were better ways for everybody to work and come up with nice objects or like useful products that people are not only uh, buying them for this community just because like, oh, I want to help them, but because they want to, to actually use them. So one of the things that also is interesting is this, this type of model that happens in Mexico since the, nine, the, the, 900, the 1900s where people buy crafts, uh, uh, handicrafts as a way of support, but these handicrafts it eventually will become trash and maybe eventually is not the, the, the right word. Is like they will become trash like right on the get-go because they're not really useful and the, and this type of buying because of pity, it's also not sustainable, for like in in all sides. So it, it it's it's like a, a really interesting challenge to sort of uh, like having like a different way of thinking or approaching these type of things, you know? Yeah. And and as I see it, it's like I don't know if if, if you ever seen these like old timey movies, like silent movies. When you have like like this guy working on this like huge steam machine and he pulls a nut, but that changes the pressure in this other. So you have to run and and, and adjust this other one, and and it's like a never ending uh, activity. You know, like then that you have to to put the the Ben Hill music because the poor guy is going. That's us working with the planet in a way, or like working mm -hmm. with these type of projects because having like doing something over here is going to to affect this other thing over here so we have to be really fast to identify what th this other part is changing and it's kind of like yeah. a never-ending story that also we have to, to think That's about. Hopeful. <laughs> a hopeful <laughs> example thank you very much um, right. just to, i'd like to sorry i'll give you the uh, address to the panelists because uh, to the audience we haven't seen any questions coming and there's one question coming in now on the Q&A we're um, scanning the chat where there's a nice conversation going on finding references but we'd also like to use some time in this session if people have questions and we'll put them forward to the panelists so I would like to encourage people to do that while I'll ask Bas and Rekje to briefly maybe add something to the ongoing discussion and then we'll stop for some questions. Yeah? So audience, put your questions in. <laughs> Bas, you were wanting to say sure. something. Yeah, I think that that image that uh, uh, Jose enacted there with the big uh, machine with all the valves mm -hmm. and the levers and the, it's about to explode, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, judging from your gestures there, Jose. It's a... Uh, it's a good image, I think, because what we've learned often in, uh, in design schools is that we need to kind of define a problem or redefine a problem and then come up with a solution. But that's a quite limited way of thinking. It mm -hmm. kind of suggests you're working in a quite controllable environment and a fairly small room, I would say, which is not at all the case uh, for what we do today and how we relate to our environment. Um, so it's quite difficult to bring the social and the cultural into that, for instance, because these are not kind of limited fields. Does and, that um, relate us to a question just coming in about uh, interdisciplinary work? Do you recognize that, that you need interdisciplinary? Yeah, I guess it, it, it connects to that because it, it, the question also says, kind of inter, talks about interventions 
as opposed to solutions. And that's something I do quite often as well to kind of replace this idea of problem solution with situation intervention. You can learn about a situation and you can intervene in it. And then you can get into this kind of situation that Jose just explained. It's kind of endless. And where you intervene, you have to also observe kind of how things actually are changing, mm. right? There's this kind of quite famous model of uh, kind of user-centered design, which is actually a continuous circle where you kind of observe, you create, and then you observe again and you learn and so yeah. on. So this yeah. goes round and round and round. And that's much more the situation we are in, I think, that reflects that image of the, uh, of the planet that I showed, where you kind of related to everyone yeah. here in this sphere. Yeah. Ah, there's another Instead interesting question. Controlling. Spark yeah, sparking off that, and maybe we can uh, ask Rekje as well. And that question is, and thinking about your school in the forest, do you then see that life-centered design is only about living things, or could it also include non-living things? It sure includes non-living things, because uh, this place in the forest that we chose and were able to rent for 29 years, uh, um, that is actually a very historic place. And I think that history and our past is very important to, to bring along. Uh, not only intervening, but experimenting with um, all the, all the, all the how do you say, experience done by both nature and human being and that interaction uh, during many years. So me and Babita in India, we were discussing the local, what is local, because we both deal with rural areas. Uh, which is not Mexico City or Amsterdam, but like out uh, out from the urbanization. Uh, and we discussed also the, the question of time, whether we are going into a future of leaving the cities and going back to the countries, at least now also with the COVID-19, that people feel more close to nature or where they were born or, you know, living in more, more remote places. What is that longing? Is that future or is it past? Uh, when, when we rediscover old traditions and self-sustainability, uh, self uh, we are in a way uh, re-experimenting um, with what we did in the past. But of course we have new technologies and 3D printing. And I think a lot design would go into uh, finding new ways of production and new ways of uh, self-sufficiency, which is not back, but forward. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bas, you want to jump in? Uh, just a very brief remark on that. It's indeed, it's, it's like a paradox. You, on the one hand, many people want to revive things from the past and there's lots of richness in the past that we have forgotten. Um, we do have new technologies now, but we also have lots of more people now on the planet. And that's often forgotten. So with so many more people, we also need to have quite different ways of living and interacting with each other than we could have like 50 years ago. Yeah, good point. Can I move the discussion? Because this is super interesting. I would love to go on for hours. <laughs> but maybe um, in the next uh, 10 minutes to close it off to maybe move it towards how can we continue learning? Because you're all basically saying we're learning. We don't know all the answers. We're learning and we need to be sensitive. We need many different people and different, many different uh, points of views. Um, but learning is also sharing knowledge and exchanging. So I would like to drop in another initiative that we have uh, started with the REACH Network and some other people in the field. It's called This is Doing. And it's a, a collaboration of people for online courses where sharing information and sharing knowledge and and learning by training and coaching together. So these fantastic people you see here are also giving a course and uh, this is doing, and the course is actually called from human centered design to life centered design. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this balance about learning. You don't know the, all the answers, <laughs> but also teaching and developing uh, further. And that folds in a little bit another question that was already uh, on the Q and A I kept for this. That's a question that goes into a bit more detail, which probably would be part of your course. And that question is what data points do you then need to collect 
uh, to design for uh, life-centered design, how do you generate new insights? And I don't think in the school we can answer that into depth, but that would be typically the conversations you would have together if you would really want to dive into this together. So maybe whoever raises your hands <laughs> can speak first. Maybe Babita, say something about that. Um, I guess just before we said anything about the course, I wanted to reiterate what I think all of us have been saying about how it's been a learning journey, like mm -hmm. Heike just said. And I think that goes back to maybe the question that uh, someone's asked here about um, the multidisciplinarity and needing to work with scientists, sociologists. I think it's also more than that. In our projects, we've been... Um, working with farmers, um, not considered experts, but the biggest experts of place that I have seen. Um, so I think even through the course, we're imagining ourselves not as masters or experts, but as uh, people who were willing to share what our mistakes and our learnings and create a community of learning through the course. So that's, that's what I wanted to talk about. Okay, interesting point. And Jose, I also saw you. Uh... Yeah, in like trying to 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 answer the the question of uh, the data points on what I think it's really important is to think to to think about life center design not not as a methodology per se, but mm. more like a way of thinking. So when you're expecting to to do a new project with this approach. I think would be a little bit limiting expecting what type of data points I have to look for. I think that's a, that, that comes with experience and with mutual learning, but also it will be, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little, bit of, a little bit of trouble trying to articulate what I'm trying to say, but I, but, but I guess what I mean is that you have to be really open to understand what is important and do that part of your research. So instead of anticipating things, you have to have like in, in your own framework, framework have a, a specific part of learning what, what's going on and that to learn what, what is important for this type of thing. So, I mean, of course, there is something that, 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 that will be interesting to, to, to look at as uh, like what type of data will be interesting, you know, it's especially when you want to, to, to say what type of impact you want to, to, to bring and how to measure it. But on the other hand, I think it's also interesting to to have more like a, less like a methodological approach and more into a observation and reaction approach. Mm. You know? Could you also say it's experiential learning, um, interactive learning rather than sort of theory learning? It's not exactly. model based, but it's it's figuring it out together, being sensitive. Uh, Ricky. I think we, you should do as trees, you should grow slow. <laughs> and and, and the, the point but I'm- do we have the time? <laughs> Excuse me? Do we have the time? Does, the, does the planet have the time to yeah. learn slow? <laughs> no, but still, uh, if, you, if you grow slow, uh, and if you do as Bas called interventions and learn from them, and if you, um, if you involve a lot of stakeholders, I agree totally with you, Babita, on the farmers being uh, being uh, not only scientist and sociologist or anthropologist, but really like taking the people uh, you work with uh, into into the project because it's not your project; it's it, it design projects that are delivering something to someone. Mm -hmm. I think they are wrong in a way. I think they should create something with. So our why is to do it with, uh, with people and with uh, all the resources and all the challenges of the place uh, and, and the, the problem you are, you are addressing. Mm. So what my point is that you should really uh, look at uh, all the um, stakeholders as data points and you should mm. pick the experience along the way and do a lot of touch base. How are we doing? Is this too quick? Is this too slow? What are the implications? What do we learn? And the more you communicate with different stakeholders, the more kind of, um, how do you say, uh, meaningful the project will be and the more you can adjust actually. This also relates to a question that came in on the Q&A about how to involve organizations and people 
and also to make sure that new regulations are being or new policies are being developed it's not just design right yeah so it's many different perspectives and stakeholders but yeah i, I can uh, provide perhaps a bit of an answer to that um i think it's quite difficult uh, to give final answers to many of these questions actually because as we keep emphasizing it's very much about kind of the engagements that you create and that people have and um what we um, I think try to do as a way of growing life-centered design or sometimes we also call it beyond human-centered design it's um, actually to create environments where these engagements can take place and where these new conversations can take place so I think uh, the REACH network is such an environment that really kind of forces you to take on different perspectives because you get uh, perspectives from Bangalore, from Mexico City, from Samsø, from Amsterdam, and so on, um, that actually challenge you in your own practice. And that's really important, I think, as, as a principle, if you want to engage with this kind of boundary stretching work mm. of your field and explore new directions, that you need to create environments where you are challenged, actually. Yeah. Um, I think what we try to do with what design can do in a platform there is is also a place to do that. So we we do indeed bring in, as has been coming up in the questions and in the discussion, people from very different backgrounds there in our research and we connect them also to the platform of what design can do, which is really important. We once had a, a presentation from a, a, a lawyer who had been, had been representing a river, I think, in a court. So those, those kind of things are really important to understand that you can actually work and think quite differently. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's, I think, the way forward. And we, we try to create such an environment with, with the life-centered uh, design course as yeah. well. We try well, to build a community there where we can learn from each other. Yeah, the question is just coming in. That is around, well, if you take all of that into account, it's important and interesting and urgent, but is it possible to carry all of that how do you sometimes you need to filter how do you go about that yeah i think it's important there to again to not see yourself as someone who needs to understand everything or needs to absorb everything it's more about the connections you make to other people and besides taking things in you can also squeeze things out to other people and and, and communities and and environments even perhaps to the river in which you swim. So that's, that's something to keep in mind, that it's you let go of the control. It's, mm -hmm. You don't need to kind of oversee everything, understand everything, have the final insights and the, the best possible opportunities. It's about yeah, the engagement and yeah, actually good to keep, growing those connections. Yeah, to keep at heart as well, that it's not only getting heavier and heavier. <laughs> Isn't that also no. one aspect of the course you're planning to do that with this experiential learning that you would hope that people bring the things they're working on along and you'll discuss those together, right? Because it is about this difficulty and complexity. Maybe each of you can say, we, we need to round off in a couple of minutes. A very brief thing about that. How, what kind of conversations do you hope to do in the, the course? Who would like to start? I see Rekje <laughs> responding. Anything you want to add there? Hmm? I thought so. <laughs> yes, um, I'd very much like uh, both to to contribute with um, with uh, questions, but also uh, suggestions and uh, and methods actually on how to engage organizations, how to engage local people, how to how to communicate along the way. Uh, so I really hope that people would bring their own projects and that uh, I can help, uh, but also that the, the co-course uh, um, uh, students would be able to, to join and help each other along the way, because the course is, has a duration, uh, and it would be really nice to really create a network where we could help each other and uh, give small insights and examples uh, along the way. So, yeah. Other people, yeah, Jose? Well, I think, uh, what I like, what I really like to discuss 
uh, when when we are like uh, coaching projects and things like that is also to to help people to find out the limitations of what they want to do. I think mm. that's really interesting and really important uh, because uh, we as uh, creatives and designers and, and, and entrepreneurs and people who want to do things, we're like really enthusiastic sometimes. And, and we like to jump in into conclusions and jump in into solutions and, and try to push those uh, without slowing it down and think about, is that possible? What will, what will be the impact for this type of thing? So a lot of my experience has been, or like a lot of my thinking of what I've been doing is also to, to take into account the, the limitations that could be infrastructure, could be cultural, could be um, uh, economical, could be security, could be like a lot of things that some, sometimes we, we overread or we ignore. And sometimes we don't want to see them. So we kind of like, like like go blind and we don't and and we pass through because they're like really complicated. So I think that's like something that is that the that for me is like really interesting and I'm really looking forward to to learn more about how to understand and and find these limitations and how can we uh, use them more as an as an opportunities in a way. Yeah. Excellent. Babita? I can, I think I'm interested and excited actually about exploring the role of narratives um, in maybe changing the frame like we've talked about, even like the question said, um, allowing people to engage with such a complex issue in a different way. We know that the facts and figures haven't taken us too far. So uh, is there a role for narratives and how do we explore that together to sort of reimagine how we engage with a topic like this. Yeah. Nice. Bas, any final comment before we close the session off? Um, maybe just a final word on that we really built that course around uh, the idea of coaching, uh, which is really in, in line with, I think, building relations between people rather than some experts who actually have the knowledge and try to uh, kind of bring that knowledge to others because that's that seems to be a bit an old model that's not quite working it needs to be much more conversational actually learning yeah well sounds excellent um so i see a question about it it might be a bit confusing so we're talking about the reach network we've been uh, <laughs> sharing the link to there. So the REACH Network is this network of agencies around the world of we all of us are partners of and there's more. So the REACH Network, you can find all the links to these pe lovely people you see here and the work they're doing. The other initiative we're talking about is called thisisdoing.com and that's actually where those courses are being offered. It's a different initiative but partly um, with the same people involved. And that's where this course, Human Centered, Design to life centered design is being offered and it's organized by the REACH Network. Otherwise, send us an email, we'll explain everything. So, a big thank you and thumbs up to the speakers. Uh, lovely to have this conversation. Could go on for the rest of the day, but we'll have to stop at some point. Big thank you to the audience. Um, thank you for your questions, very nice, and uh, sharing your thoughts on the, the chat. Stay in touch. Find us on LinkedIn, linked up. We love to be, you have a community of like-minded people. We are a community as a REACH network, but we love reaching out and being in touch with more people. And that's also the idea of these sessions to have these fantastic conversations in a, a wider community. So um, great to see you and uh, let's stay in touch.